Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 102. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm so glad that you could join me. As always, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron, and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. Your support is very much appreciated. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. March's prize is a six-month digital subscription to All About History magazine. I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you to the patron family. Now, on to today's episode. I'm excited that joining me on the show to talk about Cecily of York is Saga Hillbomb. Saga is the self-published author of four historical novels covering a range of eras, among them late 15th and early 16th century England. Her most recent publication, Princess of Thorns, was released on the 1st of March 2021. The book is written from the perspective of Cecily of York, sister of Elizabeth of York, and narrates the Wars of the Roses as well as the early Tudor period. Saga is currently working on a second edition of the debut novel. She originally completed aged 15. She also studies history in Sweden and will continue on to Magdalen College, Oxford in the autumn. Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. <laughs> Welcome to Talking Tudors Saga. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you on the show. Now, I suppose a good place to start is by you just introducing yourself to our listeners and telling us a little bit about your background. Right. So my name is Saga Hilbum and I'm a self-published author from Sweden. Uh, Now, it's a bit difficult to have an extensive background uh, since I'm just 18, but I've been interested in and I've studied history for many years now. And I think that's mostly thanks to the family I've grown up in. At the moment, I'm working on my fifth novel, as well as the second edition of my debut novel. Now, of course, there's the pandemic to consider, but if everything works out according to plan, I'll be moving to England in the autumn to study history at Oxford, and after that, we'll just have to see. Fantastic. I, I knew you were young, but I had no idea you were so young. So exceptional to have already written so many novels. How inspirational. Now, I want to talk about your new book, Princess of Thorns. Can you tell us a little bit about this one? 
Yes, yeah, so Princess of Thorns tells the story about Cecily of York from 1482 to 1503. It's not including the prologue and epilogue. So Cecily isn't very well known, but she was the third daughter of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, which made her the sister of Elizabeth of York and the niece of Richard III. And my book covers the end of the Wars of the Roses and the early Tudor period from Cecily's perspective. So it gives a rather subjective view, since it's written in first person, but I've been careful to keep it as historically accurate as possible and so on. And other than the politics and intrigues of court life, it also contains a bit of love story and plenty of tragic events. Wonderful. It sounds like a great read. Now, what in particular drew you to Cecily of York's story? Well, I remember reading a biography about Richard III a while back, and it mentioned Cecily very briefly without giving any details about her life. And I've always been fascinated by how so many people, especially women, have been central to historical events, and they've still been largely forgotten. And Cecily seemed to be one of those kind of women. So I started doing some research about her, and I found that what we do know is actually really interesting and worth telling about. In particular, her first, uh, sorry, her last marriage. And at that point, I also happened to be, and I still am, completely obsessed with the Wars of the Roses. So the idea of writing about it was irresistible. And there I had this intriguing figure of Cecily. And to have her as my protagonist allowed me to do two things, which were to narrate my favourite historical events and to call some attention to a woman who I think deserves it. Fantastic. Yeah, the Wars of the Roses are absolutely fascinating. Now, I suppose Cecily's not as well known as you've already mentioned as some of the other members of her family. So what do we actually know of her early life and her upbringing? Well, I think I should probably start by giving a bit of context for her birth. And this happened on the 20th of March, 1469. At this time, England was ruled by her father, Edward IV, since approximately eight years back. And he had then become king after the battles of Mortimer's Cross and Towton at the age of just 19, being the Yorkist claimant after his own father, the Duke of York, died. And the Lancastrian king, Henry VI, was imprisoned in the Tower, and Queen Margaret of Anjou had fled to exile in France. So a few years later, King Edward married a Lancastrian widow named Elizabeth Woodville, and they had all these children, whereof Cecily was the third oldest. And I think we might get into more detail about her siblings later on, but to say just something more about her parents first. Her father was this tall, athletic and very handsome young man, but he later grew licentious and a bit paranoid, almost like Henry VIII, actually. Uh, he indulged himself a lot in wine and women, and he had a bit of a vanity uh, but he was also a formidable warrior, I think more so than any English king who came after him. His cousin, the Earl of Warwick, he did much of the governing in the beginning, but Edward was a capable king, he wasn't just a puppet, and he had a lot of charisma. So then we get to her mother, Elizabeth Woodville, and to sum it up, she was way down the social scale until she married Edward. Historians and authors have very varied views on her. Uh, some say she was pretty much a scheming ice queen, and others don't agree at all. But what most people do agree about is that she was very beautiful and she cared a lot about herself and her family. So I think she would have had close contact with her children and Cecily during Cecily's upbringing. And in addition to this, uh, Cecily also had countless of uncles and aunts on her mother's side and two uncles on her father's side who were George Duke of Clarence and uh, Richard Duke of Gloucester. So Cecily's early years, they were marked by chaos because when she was just a toddler, her mother brought her and her siblings to Westminster Abbey and saw the sanctuary there for the first time. And this was because George Duke of Clarence and the other work had rebelled against the king for a second time and reinstated the Lancastrian king, Henry VI. So Edward had been forced to exile on the continent. And although Cecily was too young to understand what was going on, I think it must have been pretty terrifying to suddenly be whisked off to sanctuary and to have a father taken away from her. But then shortly after her second birthday, Edward returned and he defeated the Lancastrians again. So the rest of Cecily's early years, she would have spent them in um, Westminster Palace, but she might also have visited places like Nottingham Castle and Baynard Castle. She would have been educated in the typical fashion of a princess, which meant she learned to play music, she learned to dance, read and write in English, manage a large household and so on. She would have, of course, been tutored in religion, and she would also have been taught some French and history and mathematics, and she would need uh, mathematics to manage a household budget in the future. And lastly, in addition to this, she would, like almost every girl in her age and her status, she would have been indoctrinated with this 
idea of the marriage as the most important part of her life and the importance of making a profitable marriage. Although, as we'll see later, she would get rid of that notion eventually. I'm assuming that most of our listeners are probably familiar with Cecily's older sister, Elizabeth, as you've already mentioned, who eventually married Henry Tudor. But Cecily, in fact, had a number of other siblings, which you've alluded to already. Could you tell us a little bit more about them? Absolutely. Uh, Cecily had four sisters who survived infancy, other than Elizabeth of York, of course. She also had two brothers who survived infancy and two half-brothers from her mother's first marriage. So just like it is with Cecily, we don't really know a whole lot about uh, their personalities, but I'll do my best to introduce them. So first up, Cecily had one older sister, other than Elizabeth, and that was Mary of York. She was born in 1467, and she died aged only 14. And that is sadly what we know most about her. Then we have Anne of York, who was the oldest of Cecily's younger sisters. She was born in 1475 and died in 1511. She married Thomas Howard, who later became Duke of Norfolk, and who many listeners might recognise as the uncle of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. And Anne of York was my favourite sister to write about, except for Cecily, because I let her be a rather bookish and quiet person, which I can relate to. Then we have Catherine of York, but since there are so many Catherines in this period, I call her Kate. So Kate was born in 1479. She lived until 1527. And that means that her life spanned from the Wars of the Roses to after the point where Anne Boleyn entered the stage, which I think is fascinating. She married the future Earl of Devon, William Courtney. And although he was imprisoned for treason at one point, Kate remained a favourite at court. And she was the godmother of Princess Mary, that is, Mary I. Then we have the youngest of York sisters. She was Bridget, and she was born in 1480 and died aged 37. So she was quite early on intended for the church, and she lived her life as a nun at Dartford. Then there are the brothers, and I'm taking time here, but there were just so many siblings. So the oldest of Cecily's brothers was the Prince of Wales, very imaginatively named Edward, like his father. And Edward was born during the 1470 rebellion, though he would, of course, later become one of the princes in the tower. And he spent most of his upbringing at Ludlow, near Wales, uh, with his maternal uncle, Anthony of Rivers, and his half-brother, Richard Gray. So Cecily wouldn't have known him as well as she knew her other siblings. Then there is her youngest brother, and uh, who is also her favourite in Princess of Thorns, who was Richard of Shrewsbury. And he was born in 1473. And like his brother Edward, he probably died in the tower 10 years later. But uh, despite dying so young, he actually had the time to marry a young heiress, who sadly died even younger than he did. And then finally, we have Cecily's half-brothers from her mother's first marriage. These were Thomas Gray, Marks of Dorset, born in 1455, and Richard Gray, born in 1457. Now, Richard would unfortunately end his days on the block, while Thomas went on to serve under Henry VII. And out of all the siblings I mentioned now, I think we know the most about Thomas, because he took an especially active part in the Wars of the Roses. Uh, there's not much, much praise about him. For example, he, he escaped into exile with Henry Tudor, but then he tried to switch sides again. He was intercepted and forced to stay, and he was kept under close watch for the rest of his life. But he did become the ancestor of Lady Jane Grey. I absolutely love hearing about those connections. It's it's one of my favorite things, learning those <laughs> threads that that link them through time. And and I can see why you've become so fascinated with this family. Quite an illustrious roll call there, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing how all these families just they return to power time and time again. Now, I want to touch on some of Cecily's marriages as well in our episode today. So in 1474, Cecily was betrothed to James, the Duke of Rothsay, the future James IV of Scotland, who was the son of James III of Scotland. So why was the agreement eventually broken off? And did Edward IV consider other marriages for his daughter? Yes, so the engagement between Cecily and Prince James, uh, that would have made her the Queen of Scotland in due time, if that lasted. Uh, She turned 12 in 1481, which was the age when girls were considered mature enough to marry. But uh, as we know, that never happened because the tensions between England and Scotland had uh, grown over the years. And uh, in 1482, they went to war. And Cecily's father, he promised to support the Duke of Albany, who was the younger brother to King James. And he was trying to take the Scottish crown for himself. So as a result, Cecily was betrothed to Albany instead and was still intended to become queen. But then Albany failed to take the crown. And uh, after Edward then died, there was a lot of uncertainty about Cecily's status as a princess. 
So she wasn't really the ideal bride anymore. Do we know very much about what her relationship was like with her older sister, Elizabeth of York? Well, we don't know a whole lot, but I chose to portray it as a loving but a slightly dysfunctional relationship because I think it would have been reasonable for Cecily to feel some envy towards Elizabeth because she was quite literally always number two. And of course, it depends on what kind of person Cecily was, but I think that's reasonable. It does seem clear to me, though, that the York sisters had an overall close bond because Elizabeth of York, she was a famously loving mother and she appears to have cared more about her family than about politics and so on. And I think that caring extended to her, re- her relationship with her siblings as well. And um, keep in mind that they were close in age and they had grown up together during a turbulent time. But of course, like all siblings, they did have their issues. And now you've mentioned that uh, Edward IV, of course, dies quite suddenly in 1483. And this leaves Cecily and her family in a very, very difficult situation. So her mother eventually fled with her children into sanctuary again. Can you talk to us about this time in Cecily's life? Right. Well, after Edward died, uh, his brother Richard seized the crown. And I won't go into detail about why or how he did this. But as you say, Cecily's mother, Elizabeth, she took the children with her into sanctuary in the spring of 1483. And this was upon hearing that Anthony L. Rivers and Richard Gray, they had been arrested by Richard and his close advisors. So Elizabeth also brought part of the royal treasury and the great seal. Uh, And the story goes that a hole had been knocked in the abbey so that the coffers and the furniture she had looted from the palace could be carried inside. And sometimes we think of Elizabeth and her children in sanctuary, we imagine them sitting impoverished by this stone altar. But I think that's a bit of a misconception because they were quite comfortable and they probably lived in what's known as the college hall, which was part of the abbot's lodgings and it's situated on the right of the nave below the cloisters of the deanery. And that means that Cecily and her family, they must have heard the coronation of Richard and Anne Neville, which is a rather striking image uh, when you think about it. And Cecily spent almost a year in sanctuary. I think that this experience would have made her feel restless because Westminster Abbey, it wasn't exactly the most exciting place for a 14 year old girl as it was. And she would have been restricted to certain areas and rooms in the Abbey because there were guards to keep her in place. And her older half brother, Thomas, he managed to escape and her youngest brother, Richard, was taken to the tower, of course. And uh, Cecily never saw him again. So the knowledge that both he and likely her other brother, Edward, were dead, uh, that must have been horrible for her and her family. And then you add to that the grief, the anxiety, and the fear about not knowing what their own fate would going to be like. But of course, Elizabeth Woodville wasn't one to just sit idle. So she began plotting with Margaret Beaufort, amongst others, to put Margaret's son, Henry Tudor, on the throne. And as we know, Cecily's sister Elizabeth of York was betrothed to Henry and later became queen. But the thing is that if Cecily, uh, sorry, if Elizabeth had died before the wedding, then Cecily might have taken her place and become queen. So that's one of the uh, what ifs of history. I do love a good what if. And I, and I love what you say about where they were staying, because, of course, you're right. It's always kind of portrayed on screens, etc., as them being in sanctuary in a sort of bearish kind of vault in a way. And just to, to mention that it was, in fact, perhaps part of the abbot's lodgings, which were palatial and, you know, incredible kind of accommodation. That's that's really interesting. And I think I find it interesting, the image you say of them listening to uh, Richard and Anne being crowned. That, that's quite That's quite fascinating. Yeah, it must have been a bit tense in the room at that point. (laughs) Absolutely, (laughs) definitely. Now, Cecily's first husband was Ralph Scrope. Um, How did this marriage come about and why was this one eventually annulled? Yeah, so Ralph Scrope, he was a minor noble, uh, a younger son of a baron. So he would never have got to marry someone like Cecily under normal circumstances. But of course, the circumstances were not normal in England in uh, 1485 which was when the marriage is thought to have taken place. And at this point, Henry Tudor was preparing an invasion of England and his engagement to Elizabeth of York had gained him a lot of support. So if you think about it, it makes sense that uh, King Richard wanted Cecily married off to prevent her from being promised to a Lancastrian noble, just like her sister had been, or even from taking Elizabeth's place in case Elizabeth died. So the Scrope family were supporters of Richard And they were, as I said, just minor nobility. And that meant that if Henry Tudor succeeded, uh, they might not be as harshly punished. And it might also be that Richard just didn't want his nieces to marry too high up at the court. 
And of course, Henry Tudor was successful in his invasion and became king after the Battle of Bosworth. And this meant that Cecily was now the oldest sister to the future queen. So whoever her husband was, he would be in a prestigious position. And Henry didn't want that husband to be this low ranking Yorkist. So he wanted to have uh, Cicely on the marriage market and to be able to give her to his friends and family uh, as a sign of uh, support and favour. So that's why the marriage was annulled, probably in 1486. And we don't know why exactly, but probably because uh, it was never consummated, so it might just have been a temporary marriage or intended as such. I think it's safe to assume that Cicely wasn't too fond of Ralph because she had been raised to become a future queen consort or a duchess and uh, ambition did run in the family. I'm imagining that now comes another very big transition for Cecily and her family, a big change in their lives again after Elizabeth of York marries Henry VII. So what was life like for Cecily following her sister's elevation to queenship? Well, after Elizabeth uh, married Henry, Cecily became Elizabeth's chief lady-in-waiting which meant that she would have lived at court and taken part in these customary banquets and dances and court functions. So I think it must have been a relief to return to this way of life that she had been raised with and was familiar with. But at the same time, it was probably difficult to see Henry as king rather than her father or her uncle. And Elizabeth became pregnant more or less immediately after the wedding to Henry, some even say before. And Cecily likely spent a lot of time making sure that she was comfortable and healthy and so on. She would also have accompanied Cecily and some other ladies to Winchester, where Prince Arthur was born. And of course, this location was strategically chosen by Henry as part of his Tudor propaganda, since it alluded to the legends of King Arthur. Uh, Cecily also helped to carry her nephew at the christening. And this, I think, really demonstrates how important she was to court. And at some point in around December 1487, when Cecily was 18, she married again. So John Viscount Wells, who was, in fact, Margaret Beaufort's younger half-brother. So another interesting link. They had at least two daughters together. But do we know anything of those children? Well, the two daughters that uh, Cecily had with John Wells, they have almost been lost to history since they never reached adulthood. But what we do know is that the oldest one was born around 1489 and was named Elizabeth after the Queen and perhaps after Elizabeth Woodville as well. Then the younger one was named Anne, named after Cicely's sister Anne, and born around 1491. So as I said, they both died young and it's not, ex- it's not even certain uh, when exactly it happened because the case has been made that they died in infancy, but according to most sources, Uh, Elizabeth died in 1498 and Anne in 1499. Now, children died, uh, frankly, all the time, but I don't think we should underestimate the effect that losing both her daughters had on Cecily, especially in such a short time, because her husband, John Wells, he was twice her age and a staunch Lancastrian, while she, of course, came from a Yorkist family, and moreover, they lived away from court. So that leads me to think that her daughters were the only people who Cecily genuinely loved, who she could see on a regular basis. Uh, since she was a bit estranged from everyone else at that time. Cecily's second husband dies in 1499. So what becomes of her after after that event? Right. So when John Wells died, he left Cecily his estates, and it's evident in his will that he really cared for her. Uh, so I have a little quote here, yes, which please. is, Also, I give and bequeath to my dear beloved lady and wife, Cecily, for the term of her life, all my castles, manors, lands and intendments as well such as I have purchased as all other during only her life, whom I trust above all other. And he also uh, gave Cecily the uh, responsibility to pay for his masters for his soul and so on. And so she was now a wealthy widow. She was about to turn 30, which of course in our day is not very old, but in that day was older, but still marriageable. So she could have married at that time, but that doesn't seem to have been on the forefront of Henry Tudor's mind. Because as Cecily returned to court, Henry was quite busy dealing with the pretender Perkin Warbeck, uh, who claimed to be Cecily's youngest brother, Richard. Now, Cecily doesn't appear to have credited these claims, but of course it would have upset her. And the other major thing happening at court at the time was the preparations for the marriage between Prince Arthur and Catherine of Aragon. It's likely that Cecily was present when Elizabeth, uh, that is Queen Elizabeth, welcomed Catherine at Baynard Castle. And I think she would have been impressed by this exotic Spanish retinue. Cecily then carried Catherine's train during the wedding ceremony. So again, that shows her importance. 
and she participated in these absolutely lavish festivities afterwards. And these were some of my favourite scenes to write about because when you look at it, it's so clear how all this, uh, this splendour was used to strengthen the legitimacy of the Tudor uh, reign. And one more thing that I should mention is that at this time, Cicely would also have been following the political news with some interest because although Perkin Warbeck was executed, there were still other people who claimed that they were the rightful king of England. And the most important of them was Cecily's cousin, Edmund de la Pole, uh, who was called the White Rose of Suffolk. And he was plotting with the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, in the end, neither Edmund nor his younger brothers uh, came close to actually succeeding. But uh, it's possible that Cecily's loyalties were a bit torn because her sister Elizabeth and Elizabeth's children, they obviously depended now on the Tudor dynasty. But the de la Poles were just like Cecily relics from Yorkist time. And it's possible that Cecily still had loyalties, her old family, so to speak. And so tell us about her third and final marriage. And how did the Tudor court react to news of this wedding? Well, this last marriage is what captivated me the most when I first learned about Cecily's life. Because it made her feel very human to me and very brave as well. So the man she married was Thomas Kime, who was this uh, lowly squire who was a few years older than her. And to me, this marriage brings to mind the marriage between the Dowager Queen Catherine of Valois and the Welsh Esquire to Owen Tudor in the early 15th century. It's just none of this, um, this ambition and politing, politics behind it that we see in almost every other noble marriage. So I'm convinced that Cecily married foremost for love, but perhaps also because she wanted to escape from court after all these decades of intrigue and court fight and just was tired of it all. In my book, I have taken the liberty to introduce Thomas as early as uh, 1483 as a servant to the Abbot of Westminster and later as a servant at court. Now, this is fiction, but whatever Cecily's and Thomas' story was before they married, it was definitely a bold move and it shocked the court. Uh, Henry was furious and he confiscated Cecily's lands, estates, but Margaret Beaufort actually persuaded him to return some of them for the term of her life. So um, Cecily and Thomas then moved to the Isle of Wight, and they had at least two children who lived into adulthood, named Richard and Marguerite. And this uh, modest manor house where they lived is still standing today. Oh. So it's called the Great East Standard Manor, in case anyone listening wants to have a look. Absolutely. I love walking in the footsteps of people from the past, so I will. So Great East Standard Manor, fantastic. Cecily ended up outliving her older sister Elizabeth by four years or so. So what were the final years of Cecily's life like? Well, I would say they were hopefully happy and definitely quiet years. She was estranged from court and her children didn't receive any royal favours, but that was, of course, a choice that she had made when marrying for love. Uh, so she died of unknown causes aged just 38 in 1507. She was probably buried in Quar Abbey on the Isle of Wight, but unfortunately the abbey was destroyed in the dissolution of the monasteries. I can't let you go yet, Saga. This is just a fascinating, fascinating story. So I want to know, are you working on something new at the moment? Uh, yes. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm uh, working on my fifth novel, which is a Regent's novel uh, set during the uh, Napoleonic Wars and a few years afterwards as well. So it follows the life of the daughter of... Uh, Madame de Stael, who was this famous author and who opposed Napoleon and went on this fantastic escapade across Europe to stop him. Now, something I do at the end of episodes of Talking Tudors is I like to play what I call a little game of 10 to go with my guests. First question for you, what was a favourite childhood toy of yours? I don't think I have a specific favourite toy, but I had a favourite stuffed animal, which was a big grey mouse. Oh, cute. Do you still have it? I do, I think. Uh, it's in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> in storage somewhere. And what's a book that you're currently reading? Um, I'm currently not reading anything, actually. But well, I Maybe was... the last one you read. Yeah. The last one I read was Brave New World. So that was uh, one I've been putting off for a while, but it was very interesting. And what's a series that you like, a, a series or show that you've recently seen? Well, like uh, most people, I think I've been watching Bridgerton. Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> and uh, while, of course, it's not exactly historically accurate, I think it's wonderful with the costumes and the colours and all that sort of thing. Fantastic. I know I still haven't actually watched that one, so I've got to, I've <laughs> got to make time for it at some point. And what's a new skill that you would like to learn? I think I would like to learn to paint better 
that's a bit of an old skill that I've uh, forgotten now or lost. So I would like to kind of relearn painting. What music do you enjoy listening to? Well, I mostly enjoy listening to music from musicals or soundtracks from movies. Does they? I think they really have this story behind them. And what is your favourite season and why? Well, I think my favourite season is autumn or winter. Uh, the weather isn't always great, but I'm not very good with heat. So I think, I, yeah, I do like autumn and winter better than summer. Yeah, we're currently in autumn here in Sydney. It, it is my favourite season, although this week's a bit sort of stormy and, and whatnot. But generally, autumn is really beautiful here. I love it. What is a movie that always makes you cry? That has to be Les Miserables, the 2012 one, I think. I don't know why, but it's probably the songs. And opposite to that, what's something that always cheers you up? Well, if I'm feeling down, I like to watch um, an episode of something really light, uh, like uh, Gilmore Girls or Friends, or just something that you've seen a thousand times and can just watch without having to think too much about it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm sort of my go to I'll watch Call the Midwife when I don't want to think about anything else. Although I tend to cry in every single episode. (laughs) So I don't know if it's cheering me up, but I can switch off from everything else, which I love. Absolutely love that show. Obviously, exciting things. You might be moving to England and starting your degree at Oxford. Is there anything else you're looking forward to this year? Well, I think I'm looking forward to spring right now, because although I don't like heat uh, right now, it's been snowing. Right. (laughs) Uh, Although it's supposed to be spring and I think it will start to rain soon as well. So I'm just looking forward to some nice weather and um, being able to sit outside and have a barbecue or an ice cream. That sounds good. Exactly. And do you, I imagine this is, you're going to say yes. Do you speak other languages? Uh, Yes, I speak Swedish and then a little bit of Spanish from school and a little bit of Latin. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Latin's very handy, isn't it? Going through all those um, sources. And the very last thing I ask for from my guests is a Tudor takeaway. So this is just something for our listeners to go off and and look at after the show. It could be a website, a song to listen to, a movie to watch. Do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? Yeah, um, I would like to recommend a quite well-known book by Thomas Penn. It's called The Winter King, and it's about Henry VII's reign. So it contains a lot of details about, for example, the marriage between Arthur and Catherine. Um, It has these descriptions of the fancy tournaments and the pageants that I just loved reading about, uh, especially the costumes that everyone was wearing at the tournament and had dressed up their horses and everything. So for anyone who hasn't already read The Winter King and uh, also Thomas Penn's other book, The Brothers York, uh, that would be my go-to recommendation. Yeah, I've I've read Winter King, but I haven't read Brothers York. So that's one I have to I have to get on my list. Now, Saga, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and talk well, a little bit of York and a little bit of Tudors with me. Thank you for having me. I've had a great time. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners. So if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.